Okay. Okay, I think we're going to get started. So uh, today uh, in the Pulse Seminar External Speaker Series, we are super excited to have uh, Melissa Gee visiting us. Uh, I think all of you have probably read some of Melissa's papers. He has a lot of the seminal results in program analysis, verification, and synthesis. And most recently, he's been working on uh, how to formally analyze uh, distributed systems and come up with inductive invariance, which is uh, something that I didn't really think could be, uh, you know, uh, automated in any any sense in the near future. So it's, it's really surprising they pulled this off, and I'm uh, super excited for the results. Go ahead and take it away, Willie. Thank you very much. I'm kind of coming from the opposite direction. I thought that everything could be done automatically, so <laughs> maybe we are in the middle. <laughs> so uh, the goal here is that we, I mean, I'm sure here it's, we don't need this kind of introduction, but we have a program and we have some property and we want to develop some automatic tool, hopefully, that can actually either find a bug or find a proof that the property holds. And as we know, all of these properties are undecidable, uh, so we don't know how to check if a point is reachable, we don't know to check interesting properties, and actually we can't actually, as Zach said, it's really hard for the computer to do some inductive reasoning. So there are ways to handle undecidabilities, and p other people have looked at it, including uh, static analysis that do not terminate, limit the program somehow, for example, to be some kind of domain-specific, or to do some kind of abstract interpretation, static analysis to do some over-approximation, under-approximation. All of these are useful methods. And in the past, I sort of tried to do this kind of static analysis as automatic as possible, and uh, as Zach pointed out, come in. I concentrated on interprocedural analysis, shape analysis, and composition of data structures. So these are the work that I work in static analysis. But uh, I'm currently interested more in sort of trying to shift some of this method to the cloud, to network, and to distributed systems. And I've done very, very little, which I want to show you about. And just to sum out, there have been a lot of work, interesting work on static analysis both about general approach for static analysis. The Perfix is a commercial success. Polyspace is another tool which was acquired, and Coverity is another commercial success. So there have been work in static analysis, but these tools, they have a lot of false alarms, and it's really tricky to use them. And there have been another uh, lines of work, which I'm more involved, which is called domain-specific. They actually try to some, do something per domain. So for example, the SLAM, checks the correctness of device driver, Astra checks the correctness of Airbus software, Panaya, which is established by Nuri Do, my first student, is actually static analysis for uh, ERP, and Monolithic is shape analysis. All of these sort of try to attempt something about domain, a specific domain. But what I want to do is somehow try to apply it in a context of distributed system. And why do I want to verify distributed system? I guess you here you, you had Zach and you had Dan, you know that distributed systems are tricky. And the bugs occur in, re in rare scenarios and it's really hard to test these kind of programs. As a result, the tools actually miss a lot of bugs. And even small, one of the things that we found out which is interesting for us because we have bad, bad scaling problems for static analysis, that even small programs can be tricky. And here is an example. This is a beautiful algorithm actually. It's a code, it's a, it's a key value store, which is a, a, a published in CCOM01. It has many interesting features, but you look, one of the things that the author actually say, which is really nice, they say it's, simpli it's simplicity and it's provable correctness is one of its attractive features. I can, yeah. So, uh, so, so uh, a few years back, like in 2012, what happened, Pamela Ziv just showed that none of these environments that these guys are claiming, in fact, holds. <laughs> so you see sort of that these are tricky programs. And if you want to prove it automatically, Amazon already employs some kind of TLA, but these tools for TLA, as far as I understand, they don't scale well. And in, in general, I should say it's not just TLA. Many of the methods, and uh, Ken McMillan just introduced, so uh, came here so he can tell you more, but all of this automatic verification is notorious for not scaling for system properties. And you can try general purpose, and these have hard problems, even like to prove simple properties, like CRS, or unique leaders. 
You can try to do domain specific, like what was done in the, the device driver, but it's really hard for them. And essentially, what it happened that you have to have a PhD per protocol. Uh, and that's tricky. Somehow, you need to be some kind of more, more generalization. And, and, and I should say here, we have Zach here, and we have, we have uh, I guess, James. And, and, and uh, so we have all these brave guys here who are, will, who are willing to use Core. But that's a difficult task. And I have actually, before I visited you, I visited MIT. And there it seems like they're even, I mean, they're also brave, I guess. And what, <laughs> what they do, they take a file system of the 70 which is something that even I was taught, and they, they have so, such a hard time proving it's correct. So I don't know what they're going to do with the real thing. So the question that we are asking ourselves, can we uh, automatically verify this kind of thing? And verification, as far as I understand, is about generalization. And when we talk about general purpose properties, it's really hard for them what we do is to to actually en enable automatic generalization. And domain-specific is also kind of very hard handcrafted. So what we want to do, we want to have some kind of approach where, where it's automatic, but it somehow checks with the human uh, uh, the properties that they want. And the challenge is how to present the question in a way that somehow we can, for example, interact with them, interact with somebody from this community. So what is the trick? The trick is very sort of basic that you have learned many, many times, but I just want to follow it. So I have to tell you what is an inductive environment. So the idea is I look into a program, come in, and the program is represented by a transition system. It's, a, it's an infinite graph with nodes, and you start, the system starts with the initial state, and every time you see it's execute another step and another step, and these are the states which are reachable. Now, what we want to do, we want to find out an invariant which is inductive. So what is an inductive invariant? It covers the reachable state, and it follows these three properties. That first of all, it doesn't interact with the bad state, or the invariant is derived the safety property. It's, 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 a, it's a, the initial state implies the invariant. And the most interesting property that somehow it's tricky to, to that we have to understand is the, the fact that the invariant is closed under the transition system which is called consecution. It means that whenever you take a state which is satisfied the environment, and you execute one step with the transition system, it still satisfies the environment. So for example, this is a good transition. This is also a good transition, but this is a bad transition. We don't want to allow transition which goes outside the, the state. So what happened is that now with this inductive verification, we take the program, we take the safety property, but we also come with this candidate inductive environment. The interesting thing, once we have it, we can fit it to the solver. And now the solver either gives us a proof of the property holds, or it gives us a counterexample. But it's not necessarily a counterexample. It's a counterexample to the induction. So it's basically just say that this environment is not inductive for, for the proving the safety of this property. And it's important to understand and what this kind of induct inductive in environment means. It can mean many things. It can mean a bug in the code, of course. But it often means a bug in the environment. It means a bug in the safety property that you want to verify, which is open to us many times. We are trying to prove a property, but in fact, and that's actually, if you go back to core, there's nothing wrong in core. The problem with core is, I finally understand that the, these guys, they actually didn't specify exactly what it means for them to be correct. And there's the property specifying that what they mean is correct is very, very tricky. So that's the second thing that happened. And the other thing that can happen, this is the third case, that says that this counter example to induction is actually represent an unreachable state. So this is where the environment is too weak, it has to be strengthened. And you can, you can exclude this counter example to induction, but that may not be enough, because then there's another one, and there's another one, and there's another one, and so on. OK, so let me demonstrate it by a very a trivial example. So this is a program. It has no distribution. It's, it has nothing. You see, I start with x is 1, y is 2, and then I have a loop, infinite loop. And here is an environment which holds that x is greater than 1. Okay? This is an environment which is hold. But in fact, you see, the tools give us a counterexample. And Z3 will give you a counterexample. Everything will give you. Why does it give this counterexample? Can anybody tell me? And the counterexample is x is equal to 1, y is equal to minus 2. It doesn't know that y is always positive. Exactly. 
It doesn't know. It's not, this property is not inductive. It, it's, 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 it sort of takes the devil and say, oh, if I take arbitrary element, which is x greater than 1, I have to show that it's preserved by the transition. And you notice if, for example, you take this counterexample and say it's not minus 2, it will give you minus 3. Otherwise, it will give you minus 4 and so on. So you need to figure out something about this problem. You need to figure out about, and this is what we call this counterexample to induction that we want to avoid. And when you are fine coming with inductive environment, you have to come with this kind of properties. This is what Zach is, is doing. Uh, not Zach, James and others. OK. <laughs> so, so, OK, sorry, sorry. So what happened is to see you have to come up with the inductive environment. Once you come with this inductive environment, the tools like Z3, it can actually prove the problem. So there is a nice project by Brian Farner, who, who we all know, and from Microsoft, and it employs this deductive verification. It shows that it's useful to verify real estate stem. Uh, and this is a nice paper in SOSP. It verifies all the, le the levels. This is nice. But the problem with it is it's really hard to write this inductive environment. And worse than this, even if you are willing to write this inductive environment, since it used tools like Z3, and since this formula is complicated, it may be actually that even when you write this inductive environment, it's unable to show that it's inductive. So, there are, so there's, sort of, there's another problem which is difficult here. And there are quantified alternation, it leads to matching loops, it leads to unknown, it leads to all kinds of things, complicated arithmetic. So this is very, very tricky. So these are the things that we want to avoid. So in fact, we have now three challenges. One is that you want to specify the properties. That's very hard. The other one is we have to come up with the inductive environment, which is also hard. And finally, we have the deduction. Even when you have a candidate inductive environment, then, in fact, it's undecidable to check it. So there are two undecidable problems that we want to realize about. And you notice that even in the case that it's deductive, it, 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 deduction is decidable, still this can be undecidable. So we have this very hard problem. So here is what I want to tell you. I want to tell you about a recent work by Alden and Ken. Ken is here, so he can correct me in all the mistakes. And uh, I'm kind of helping here. And I should say, Ujit Panda, who is a system guy who help us with the system, and Sharon Shoham from Tel Aviv University. It's a method, and, and I should say, you can download the tool now and play with it, and you can download the paper. So you can, you can actually see how this tool works. All this tool is available in public domain, and I will give you a kind of a, a, a demo of it so you see how it works. So it's a tool for proving this uh, safety. And it's not automatic. It's interactive. So how do we do this? Can we want to develop a system tool for to verify real protocol. And we understand that this automation is limited, but we know it's actually a very useful thing. So what we want to do, we want to somehow engage the user in this procedure in the same way that Cork does, but in a much more automatic way. And the, the, the thing is that we want the system to, to fail in a visible way, so the user, unlike normal static analysis, will never get stuck. So whenever you want to prove a property, you can prove it. So maybe this is somehow just to show you this from a high-level perspective. On the right-hand side, you see the most automatic tools, like static analysis, which I work, and many others. Of course, they are type checking. All of these things, they are fully automatic. And when they work, they're great. But they have limit expressive power. And then it seems like Zach likes to work here. Okay? <laughs> this is beautiful. It's a okay. great graph. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so, so Cork is, is fully, it's very expressive. But it's, it's very manual. You have to write the environment by yourself. You have to, to, prove the induction, uh, to prove the deduction yourself. So you have to do everything yourself. Daphne goes one step in the sense that you write the environment, but the system automatically tries to prove the inductiveness. So as I, share, I say, sometimes it can fail. And then you have some user tricks. I don't know what Ken says, but they are very, very hard to use. If, they, if it, this matching loop, in order to handle them, it's very, very hard to use. So this is the case. So what IV does, IV is, first of all, we eliminate the idea. Deduction for us is decidable. We never, whenever we write something, we're going to guarantee that Z3 terminates. So we limit the language in the sense that deduction for us, although we are using still Z3, it's always guaranteed to terminate. No more matching loop. You will see how we do it. And for, the, for, finding, for writing the environment, we know they are hard. So we want to somehow have a collaborative effort between the user and the system. And I'll show you how we do it. So that's how we do it. And there are sort of two key insights behind IV. 
One in which is so simple, but still it's, it's, it's very important, is that we have a very limited programming language. We don't actually let you write, we let you write in a programming language which is too incomplete, but it's a very, very limited programming language. And this is a language which somehow allows us to express everything we care about protocols, and it will remain to be seen if it's good enough. But so far, we have been using it for, for many things. And it's an event-driven program, and deduction is decidable even with such solver, because it, it's a, and in fact, we think, and Ken actually has ideas how to compile it into efficient code, but that's not going to be the, the subject of this talk. So this is the first idea, and I'm going to show you this, that we have a simple modeling language, which is, which is, which is weak, but strong enough. And, and the second thing is that the invariant generation is fundamentally based on some kind of generalization. And the way we do generalization is by, co by cooperative process between the human, human and the autom automated heuristic. And this will be understood once we uh, see examples. So I want to show you everything in the context of one example. I'm going to use this example throughout the talk because it's such a simple example. So it's a, I'm sorry for the distributed computing people. So this is the example of a leader election. Everybody knows this example. You can probably prove it automatically, but that's not the subject of it. I want to show you how we do this. So basically, we have nodes, unbounded number of nodes. They are in a ring. They are connected by a next node. And each, each node sends its, uh, its ID to the, to the next node, uh, and, and when a node, and, and if a node receives ID which is greater than this, it passes it, either it's, otherwise it drops it, and if a node receives its own ID, it declares himself a, read, a, a leader. Okay, and the safety property here is obvious that you select at most one leader. So, and there's, this is a, a fine protocol. There is a proof, you see it's a beautiful proof in the CACM, there's nothing really wrong with it. It's very nice. But you see, this proof, it uses this high order reasoning. It says only one message and it's highest and so on. That's not how we're going to use it in IV. In IV, it's a much more lower level proof that you're going to see. You're not going to see this kind of proof. Maybe with Cork, I don't know. But we, not either. Yeah. But, but we're going to show you a much lower level proof, not as, as, uh, as, as, as concise. OK, so first of all, how do we model the program? So we model the program, as I said, with this relational modeling language. It basically it supports finite relation, it supports loops and imperative constructs, but it doesn't have any numeric values. It has qu quantification, but there are no, quanti there are no quantifier, there is just quantify free updates. It only support, support universal uh, properties. Actually, we have shown in previous work that we can show us, use similar language for software-defined network, but it's, 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 a, it's a very, very limited language. Okay, so I'll show you this language. I can give you the syntax, but I prefer to show you this by means of an example. Okay, so here is the, the leader election. You see, I'm just defining number of relations. So basically, you see there is ID, which is total order of IDs. I don't actually have integers. I have only total orders. So there's a total order on ID. The topology, there is a between node, 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 which means that the node in the middle is the node in the shortest path between the two nodes. So this is how I encode the, the ring topology. And there is ID, which is a function from a node to ID. And there is a pending, which says that some ID is, is pending on some node. And leader is a unary, unary relation, which says that one node is a leader. OK, so you see that the safety property says that the, there exist no two nodes, which are the leader. So this is the safety property. And here you see the code. It's a loop. And then in the loop, you non-deterministically decide if you send or you receive. OK, and you can arbitrarily send an arbitrary messages. And every time you send a message, you non-deterministically select two nodes in the ring. You insert, a node, you insert the ID of one node into the other node. The receive is slightly more complex. You take, an, you take a node from the queue. You remove it. You check if it's the ID is M, you, you, you insert it into the leader. Otherwise, you check if it's less or equal. And then, and then, and then you, 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 you basically check the ring and then you insert into the next element. So this is a programming language, and this is how we model things. And just to tell you about sort of what you are familiar with, this is, we are familiar with, of course, C, Java, and Python. They're great. They are executable. But for them, undecidable, the deduction is undecidable. And of course, they're too incomplete. And Daphne is similar. SMV is more, is more expressible. It allows you to decide verification properties, but in fact, it's not expressive enough to, uh, sorry, it's less expressible. 
it's, it's better for verification, but it's only expressive for fine state properties. Quark is, of course, very expressive, but, decide, but the, in, the checking deduction is manual. So what we do here, you see that, in fact, we will have executable in the, in the future, but now we have decidable deduction. And notice also it's a Turing complete co language. It means everything that you want to write, you can write in this language. OK, so that's that's nice property of it. So what can we do with it? So the first thing that we can do, it's trivial, but it's still very useful. We can find bugs, OK? We can find bugs, OK? We, you take the leader, you take a bound, and we find a bug. And basically, we, how do we find a bug? We actually wrap a formula to the site solver that says that there are k transitions that, that break the, the node. Notice that, in fact, we, we, we bound the number of transitions, but we don't bound the size of the ring. It's not necessary for us to bound the size of the ring. We are working on this decidable fragment. Basically, we just need to bound so we can prove, in fact, for example here, that up to k step things are OK. So that's useful. And of course, we can find bugs. So let me show you this in the, in the leader election. So you see here, the leader election, the, it found a bug. OK, what is the bug here? You see that now you see there are node n1. It's not the leader. There's a node 2, which is not a leader. They both share the same ID. You see, this is the topology. And now this, this node sends, the first node sends a message, so it, it, it uh, becomes pending. The second node sends a message, so it becomes pending on the first node. And then the first node receives, and the second node receives, and they both become linear. And what is the mistake? What? Exactly. This is a mistake in our model. It's just a mistake in our model. We have to write in our model to, that these things are not the same. OK, and that's what we do. We have to add this axiom. Once we added the bounded model checking succeed. OK, you can do this until you get tired. After that, you get tired. Now you want to find it, you prove things by induction. Here, things get much more interesting. So this is where this procedure, this iterative procedure works. You take the program, you take this candidate inductive, you check this inductiveness. Since we are working in this decidable logic, we know that this will never fail. If it, if it finds inductive, it's great. If it's not, then in fact we can compute a minimal model. We can compute a minimal uh, in terms of, of the size of the graph that actually set that counter example to induction. And then we, we work with the user to generalize it. And once again, we modify this candidate invariant and keep the step. And in our case, usually we think that in few steps, we find this inductive invariant for these kind of protocols. Yes, Amina. So only this works, uh, I'm assuming, because your logic has some kind of a small model property? Yeah, the, the, the logic has a very small model property. So it's basically just effectively propositional logic, which means that only the existential properties care. It's a very, very weak logic. It was the finite relations in particular, right? Yeah. Finite, finite relations. relations. So it doesn't matter how many yeah. nodes end up in your network, you can only No, no, but it's two things. It's the finite relation and the fact that we don't have quantified alternation. It's a very important thing. So <laughs> that basically, with, yeah, even yeah. with finite relation, you can say something, I have a next, and I have next, and I have next, and I have next, and I have next, and it's different than other things. Yeah. I understand. So yeah. there's sort of two things that we limit you. We limit what you can uh, state, and we limit, and we limit the, the relation to be finite. But usually limiting the relation to finite is actually makes something harder from, from decision procedure. OK? okay. But the thing which we limit is the quantification. That's important. Yeah. Which is also why you don't have to limit your state in the Bonner model. Exactly. You're just limiting the number of transitions. Exactly. We limit the alternation. We limit the point. We will see that. Now, the most interesting thing is how we do this generalization. So basically, we generalize by removing fact from the conjecture. And you will see, basically, we believe in graphical user interface. So we let the user select the thing to be uh, removed graphically. And we can check. One of the things that we can check is that check if a conjecture is true up to k step. And IV uses such solver basically to check that. And we also automatically remove more facts. And once again, we can show this, we can use such solver because essentially, when something is not sat, we can ask it to be co unsat. We can actually find the smallest thing which is still. So that's how we do this generalization, all used on the such solver. So once again, we provide projection. This is just, we provide convert projection to a state. And there are these two steps that I will show you, bounded model checking. The check if a conjecture is hold k times. We already see it. And interpolation of k, which actually strengthens a conjuncture while keeping it two k steps. And both of these can be computed with a SAT solver such as Z3. 
So let me show you this in the context of the ring. Okay, so this is the, I, I gave this thing to the, uh, to the, to the slab solver. So you see uh, the, the property on the, on the ring, the leader election, is that I have a unique ID. Here's the leader, and here is, you see, I give the candidate inductive environment to be the property that we want to prove. That's common. And I, I, I feed the formula to the SAT solver, and the SAT solver gave us a counterexample. Okay, so that, once again, it's not a counterexample to the, to, the, to the code, it's a counterexample to induction. It says that if I execute this step, I, I, I start with something which satisfies the environment, and after one step of receive, the environment is broken. Okay, so what's going on here? I, see, I have a step, and then I execute it, and I have the environment which is broken. Okay, and what I can do, and that's usually what people do with counter example guess, guided refinement, is they take this state and they negate it. Okay, this is called the diagram in logic. Basically, you take this state and you negate it and you get something which is not true. Okay, that's good, but that's not going to terminate. That's going to go forever and forever and forever. Because you have, you see, there are a lot of properties here that, in fact, not really important for this algorithm. For example, it really, this bug is, has nothing to do with the topology. Okay, this bug has nothing to do with the queue. This bug is here. There's something that you need to understand about the algorithm here. Okay, so, so here I show you the bug. And maybe you guys, you stare at this bug for a moment and tell me what is the bug here. You, you look into, the, you understand the protocol. The protocol has to select one. What is the bug here? Can anybody see the bug? What is the bug? You don't need to understand anything about verification, just about this protocol. The protocol, I'm showing you, there are two nodes. One of them is lock, uh, is a leader. The other one is not a leader. This is the topology. And, and this node ha has, has ID. And the node, which is, I already told you, the, almost the thing. Yes? The node with the smaller ID is the leader. Exactly. That's, that's, the leader should have the highest ID. That's, a, that's the bug that you find. And we want people to figure that out when they see the code. I should say, from Panda's experience, it works. But we have one <laughs> experience. So we want people to figure out what's going on. Once you figure that out, you realize that this has nothing to do with the topology. This has nothing to do with the queue. We can just project them out. They are not important. In fact. So you see that I take this graph here, and I project. I project. All the topology is thrown away. All the queue is, is thrown away. Of course, when I do this, now I exclude more state. Because this one here is the node to think it's not really important. And of course, you see, this formula is much more what I like. It says that there exist not, not, there cannot be two nodes such that they are different. One of them is a leader, another one is not a leader, and the other one is, is greater than it. OK, and this one, we can bound the model, check it, and check it's OK. Interestingly, we can also do interpolation and try to generalize it. And you see here it did something terrible. What happened? The SAT solver did something terrible. What happened here? This doesn't seem right. How can this happen? It's just because the SAT solver here, in order to have interesting bug, you need three. Because otherwise, the SAT solver, actually, you see what the SAT solver told you. It told you there cannot be two nodes in which one of them is the leader. That's nonsense. OK? Mm -hmm. So what we do, we need to actually go to a higher k. If you have three, then in fact the bounded model checking will be OK. The, the, the interpolation will be OK. And you notice that it generalizes it. OK, so now we generalize it and we got, we got the property that we want. OK, so this is nice. This looks good. We have it in our inductive environment. So now we know that the, the leader has the highest ID. Once again, we execute it one more time. You see it still finds a counterexample to induction. We look into this counter example to the induction. Once again, we look at it and we see what's the property. Here, the problem is that you see this says that only the highest ID can be self-pending. So that's a slightly more interesting property in the environment because it's relate the Q to the, to the, to the property. OK? It's relate the Q to the property. But take, once again, once we realize it, you know, for example, this is not dependent on the topology. Now we can project the topology away. We can project the topology away, and we can get the property that we care about. OK, so we got the property that we care about. We do this interpolation, and we get the property that we care about. It didn't do so much generalization, but still, you see, it found the property that we want. It found the property that we want, that now, if a node is self-pending, it must be the highest ID. So we found the property that we want. Now, 
the, 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 the third step that we do, we once again, we take this, this variant that we take, and once again, we get this counter example to induction. This is interesting. You see, now we got an example with three nodes. It means that we cannot, it couldn't find an example with two nodes. The smallest example it could find is an example with three nodes. OK, and this is an even more interesting example. Can somebody tell me what's going on here? That's, again, slightly understanding of this protocol. What's going on? What's, why is this example going on here? You see, there is three nodes, one of them the next, and one of them is pending. And the, the, I'm showing the IDs in, in, a, in, in increasing order. What's going on? A message couldn't have passed. Uh, exactly. You cannot pass a, 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 a note with higher IDs. So we need to understand this kind of thing. And once you understand this, again, you can project it. You see, for example, here, the user did a mistake. It projected the pending and ID and, and, and less or equal. So of course, the system will check it. Here, you see, because here, the problem is that it, really, it depends, of course, on the topology. So we want it for a projection. You see, we take the projection, the ID, the between, the less or equal. Because we need to, in fact, take, uh, care about the topology. We get the property that we want. And now we do this bounded model checking. We get this interpolation, and we see we get this property that we want. We get the property that basically say that if a node is between, and if a node passes, then it must be greater th than this node. So we, we got this kind of procedure. And du during this procedure, we, we found the property that we want. So finally, we get this i0, i1, i2, i3. We feed it to this tool. We have this unique leader, and then the SAT solver gives us a proof. So we notice that in the procedure of it, we eventually found the inductive invariant. And I should say this inductive invariant is nice. It has this property that we care about. OK, sometimes maybe, but this is the procedure that we imagine people do. They take this tool, they start, they find bugs, and once they find bugs, they, they, if they, they fix the bugs either in the model or in the proof. But if they, once they get this, the, this thing, they generalize and they get the property that they want. OK? So what do we verify? We verify very little things, I should say. So we verify this leader in the ring. You see, these are the number of types. These are the number of relations. This is the property. This is what we wanted to verify. These are the literals. This is the environment that we find. Of course, the environment is more complex than it. These are the number of generalizations. Learning switch is a distributed spanning tree. DB chain replication is something that Panda came is a is a is a met is a is a, a database replication which we want to show that it's serializable. Uh, this was interesting because in the procedure of doing it, we found actually many bugs in this protocol. So and the, uh, you see that invariant here is slightly more complex, and there are seven steps. Code is a, is a, I should say, we didn't verify the whole sort of uh, protocol of the call. We basically verify the connection, right? Ken? Yeah, we, we verify the ring maintenance. First. Exactly. We find the, the, we verify the ring maintenance. And that's a little interesting because this ring is going, is, is, the edges are being removed and added. And still we can verify that this is maintained. And again, this for unbounded protocol. And as far as I understand, our proof is simpler than Pamela's, right? But that so, was Dave's version of court with the stable base. This was with a similar assumption to Dave's, so actually a, a weaker assumption. Okay, so so that so, sorry, just, so that property is more, as I recall, right? Isn't that more of like a Leibniz property? It's as long as there, are, like, no matter what, if you're in a reachable state, and then there's some number of repairs you need to do, as long as there's no future disruptions, then eventually you'll get to a state with the ring. Yeah. So so we didn't prove the Leibniz property. We only proved the um, connect connectedness property. Okay. Just to say that all the nodes remain connected. Ju the just the, the connectivity. Bifurcate into two separate. Rings. I, I should say all of this work is limited so far to safety. Okay. We didn't do anything for liveness. And of, of course, inductive environment, when you do liveness, you want to do something else. You want to do some, you need some fairness, yeah, yeah. progress measure, or something. This is actually very nice. It's an example that was uh, suggested from Verdi, the log server. You, it's nice because it tells us how to comp compare to, 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 to Verdi. So you see, it's, I think for Verdi, it's 500 lines of code, of coke. And I don't know how long it takes you. It took you to come with this environment. Days. For okay, sure. so it's one hour, but I should say I write one or dead hour. It's yeah. not one of mine. <laughs> 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 I, I should say.
should be a little bit more careful. That is a fast guy. It's, uh, I've, I've seen him. Uh, so it's one or that's hour, maybe one can hour, but not definitely one mule's hour. So a distributed lock is actually interesting. It's an example which was given us by Brian Parno, and for him he said that coming with inductive invent was a matter of months, and it took us also another hour. I should say again, one or that hour. But it's uh, interesting if you guys can see. We have also tried with simple consensus, but not, we are working now on raft on other things. So I want to tell you a little bit. I don't want to run over time. I want to tell you a little bit uh, what Amina asked about the logic here. So basically, the logic here is based on SAT solver. We all know we have a propositional formula. We want to determine it's valid or satisfiable. This is something that is done in our community, and we have an algorithm which scales well. So what we want to do, we're going to go a little bit beyond this. We have what we call effectively propositional. So effectively propositional is limited fragment of first order logic, which is restricted when you have exist for all. And you don't have real function symbol. And therefore, as Amina said, we have a small model property. Every time you have a formula, for example, here is a formula, exist x1, x2, such that for all y, r x1, y, if and only if r y, x2. So this formula, you want to check it. Usually, you need to check it on unbounded world. But here, it's, this formula is satisfiable if and only if it's satisfiable on small world. So if you check the, want to check the validity, you check the satisfiability of the negation. So you see here, this formula is satisfiable if and only if it's satisfiable on two constants, C1 and C2. And this means that now we can just bit blast it. And we can just convert it to a formula. We instantiate y with all the values. And finally, we get a propositional formula. So the formula at the top is satisfiable if and only if the proposed formula at the bottom. When you look at it, you say this is bad because it's ex there's exponential expansion. But tools like Z3, they are smart. They don't actually. They do it in a more lazy way. And in fact, this, there are other tools like iProver, Vampire. This formula has an NXP time complete. And there's actually sigma 2 in their hierarchy if you have uh, actually limited relation. So there are good such solver for this kind of thing. And also, I have to say that we have to write axioms. There is a cheat here that uh, somehow I didn't uh, point to say that, in fact, we have to write axioms. And we have to write axioms that, that, that model the domain. For example, total order or ID, we have to write axioms. And the relation between, we have to write axioms. But this is done for all. Once for all the rings, once for it's done for all of the things. So basically, for example, for all the rings, we have to write these properties. OK, for example, we have other properties for trees. We have other property for link list. We have ax and we have sound and complete action for, for for similar cases that we can do. And this is of course we do by hand. Okay, this we have PhD. Okay, we have one PhD for the ring, but it's not for the leader and ring. It's for all the rings. Okay, I want to make sure that this is okay. So this allows us to do this algorithmic bounded model checking. We take the algorithm and we take the bound, and basically we get this EPR formula. And we fit it to the SAT solver, and we get the property. It also allows us to, this is how we design RML. RML is, is designed in a way that actually the program is also in the form this exists for all. So basically, that's how it goes. And in fact, the property is always for all exists, and the inductive invite is for all. And so far, we get, we get this property. So that's how RML is designed. It has many features, like macros and everything, but it makes sure, it make, it make sure that this property holds. So therefore, we can check algorithmically if a property is inductive, and we get either counterexample to induction, or we get a proof. So this is basically, and you look at it, this is nice, because for universal environment, they capture this forbidden configuration. They capture the thing that, in fact, we have a configuration, and, and, and they, are, they, are, they are somehow can be extended in any way that you want. So that's nice. Sort of, we can show everything by terms, by means of example. So currently, we are doing user study. We are trying to improve the user, the, the UI. Ken has already support for modular, modular reasoning and compiling to efficient code. We are trying to apply it in more applications, like Raft, Paxos. And we will be happy to work with people here on, on things. Pi system, we, tr we started working with the MIT group. So we will be happy to work with you on trying, trying these ideas. Uh, we also try to work on increasing effectiveness. So for example, reason about things that are not expressed with universal formulas. And we have some tricks. Usually what we do, we steal idea actually from the database in the sense that we have something like materialized relation, for example, it's transitive closure. And then and that's actually how things can work in, 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 in many cases. Like for example, that you update 
you have data transitive closure, but still we can express it in a sound and complete way as long as it, it's a deterministic function in this lim limited uh, logic. So that's really nice because we take something which is not expressible in first order logic and still we express it in this weak logic. And we also reason about independent function. You can read more in Shachar's thesis, like, uh, and this allows us to reason about modularity. We are also, of course, we believe that at the end of the day, we want to be more automatic. And we have some method to, in some cases, we can, for example, there's a paper in Popel by Odell, where it showed that it's decidable to infer this inductiveness. The problem is that this decision procedure is very high, its exponential, its, its, its complexity is very high. So in fact, it's not practical, and we want to do something much more practical. We also try to make the SAT solver better, because I should say, and Ken can tell you that, even though I tell you it's scale, it's not going to scale, for example, to a higher bound. It would be difficult to, to run this kind. So we are trying to understand something about the domain to make it more efficient. So what did we learn here? So I think what we learned here is that one thing which maybe it's obvious, but the user and the machine into heuristic is somehow complement each other. So the machine is really strong in sort of finding counterexample. For example, maybe you didn't look at it, but for example, the think about equality. The machine actually is pretty smart to figure out what must be equal and must not be equal. That somehow things that for user are hard. But other things, like for example, figuring out like the properties that you can figure. The, the human is better, especially when we talk about these small protocols that you understand them. So this is somehow interesting. Another thing which is perhaps surprising is that you can prove these properties without reasoning about, about arithmetic and others, because you capture them in somehow parametric way in this uh, logic. And that's reasoning, include reasoning about unbounded topology, about unique passes, and about other things. OK, so I don't know. I wanted to talk about some other things, but uh, how much time I have? Uh, 10 minutes. So. 10 minutes. OK, so this is a sort of another work which is slightly related, uh, which was done also by Panda, who is here. And it's uh, some work that we are trying to apply similar method to reason about stateful computer network. I don't know how similar they are. So what problem are we trying to solve? It's also distributed set setting, but it's much sort of more fixed uh, properties. And we, if we think about classical network, usually we think that everything interesting is going on the edges. And we think that firewall, all the things, they somehow, and there we have these switches that provide end-to-end -end connectivity. But in reality, there are bad guys. Once there are bad guys, then the network is much more complex. So a study shows that, in fact, in the network, there are, I don't know, many of these guys which are called middle boxes. There are some kind of state changes, like firewall, cache proxy, all of these guys, and they change the behavior. And they have states. They remember things. For example, the firewall usually remember if, 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 if a node sends the node to another node, then it remembers to send it back. So there are states going on. And cache proxy is another case that you remember the, the property. So the question is, these are intermediate states, like network, firewalls, the traffic, and all of these guys, they are, they are in the middle of the network. And they make the problem many, many bugs. For, and these bugs that we care about are misconfiguration errors. Some kind of problems between how the topology is laid that we get a, a, a misconfiguration error. And there is a citation that says that, in fact, many failures occur to this kind of error. So here is a very, very sort of uh, simple example of this kind of bug. I have a cache proxy, and I have a firewall. And I want to say that A is isolated from B. And this will not be the case here. Do you see why? This will not be the case here. This is, it's supposed to be the case that the proxy, the, this has, guy has deny A, and, and still A actually can go into B. How can this be happen? Because when A goes to B, the cache proxy, because it actually has to remember the, the source, it rewrites the source address. And therefore, it sends P, because it has to remember how it returns to it. OK, so as a result, the, 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 node, the node A, the uh, packet from node A, is uh, arrived at the node B. So this is a kind of bug that we want to check about. And how do we do it? So we, we assume that the middle box is essentially a finite state machine. For many of the things, at least for our property, this is OK. 
once we do this, we can actually reason about the interaction, and we can show that, in fact, the network is some kind of a concur or concurrent finite state machine. And then we have some, some complexity results say, how complicated is it to check the correctness of the network? So for example, stateless, which is simple, then we can check it for FIFO and its polynomial time. Increasing, it's also increasing. I mean that the forwarding is increasing. But uh, progressing is a weird name, but it sort of says that you don't have cycles in the automata. Then still, even there, you see that once you have a FIFO, it becomes undecidable. So what we do, we maybe it's uh, related to what I told you then, that basically we assume that we have no order on the package. Once we have no order, then it's decidable, but it's uh, 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 still very expensive. So how do we handle this expensiveness? We use the same trick that I showed you before. We use this logic, and we use it, and we feed it to, to Z3. And this doesn't scale well, but still, uh, we, we have to find some way to scale it. So what we do, we have some slicing. We have some way to, to combine several switches into the same switch. And so let me close by a simple example. Here is this idea of scalability with slice. So basically, this is the internet. This is a data center. You see the, 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 there is a firewall. There is a load balancer. They're all connected to the get, to, together. And we want to check some safety property. So these are the time to check the safety property. And what you can see this time, you see that once a, one, so the safety property is either public, that says that the node can talk to all nodes, quarantine that says that the node can only talk to few nodes, and private, which is uh, very limited or more complicated topology. You see that basically the slice, the interesting thing that you see yeah. is that even though when we grow, when the number of nodes and middle when the number of hosts and middle box grow, the, the 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 complexity of the verification becomes harder. But still, the slice is still small. So in fact, the time for 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 checking these slices is independent of the network size. But of course, it uh, depends on the on the on the complexity of the of the topology. So that's it. I I uh, hope I didn't. Uh, I think I'm didn't run off the time. I just want to sort of finish this thing, say, look, this is a, actually a, a slide that I really like. I don't know if you guys, but this is somehow how, uh, I should say, I, I learned it from Vivek Sarkar. But this is somehow what kind of programmers are in the world. OK, so there are, so there are students like us, hackers, researchers. And then you see, the more, of course, we go, oh, there are more, more type of users. And the reason is that why I, I'm interested here is that, in fact, there are bugs everywhere. I want to tell you, actually, we are working now on the cloud. You can f find bugs here. You can find bugs here. You can find bugs everywhere. And the thing that is maybe, actually, you could see that in many lines of the work, and maybe even in this line of work, that there is, and this is sort of the, the common belief in the verification community, that there is a tendency between scalability and precision. Basically, you want to have something more sc scalable you make it more precise. And I think that, and then there are algorithms, of course. Start solving everything. All of them are trying to put this kind of things. Consequence finding, constraint solving, these are interesting. There are applications like bug finding, program synthesis, where Amina is interested, comparison. All of them sort of explore this network and distributed protocol. And of course, foundational work. So one thing that I think we have shown and many others, which is slightly surprising, I think, that by domain specialization, we actually get something one which, which is both precise and scalable. That's actually interesting. Once you fix something for the domain, once you understand something for the domain, you get static analysis which is both precise and, and, and scalable. And what I like to speculate is that maybe user interaction is another thing, which I have not proved to you, but I have guessed here. That user interaction is something that actually will get you something which is both precise and scalable in the sense that you can, at least if you carve the problem right enough, you can get this thing to work uh, in, a, in a good way. So that's what I say. Now, how do I somehow see the things in the future? I really believe somehow in the connection between AI and AI, in the sense that I believe in the connection between machine learning and static analysis somehow. And I believe that somehow there is some kind of world for super supervised formal verification. Somehow, some way that we can find a way to, 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 to the right interaction between the program and the, the tool. 
And we want to ask the question in the way that the language and the domain actually speak together. And of course, we want to push, push this limit and reason about quantitative and probabilistic correctness, liveness, and to apply to a real application, uh, like I talked about cloud and network. So thank you very much for your time. I think we have time for a few questions for Muli. So one thing I was curious about, uh, you mentioned the compilation uh, to actually execute the distributed systems that you're reasoning about. That's uh, you know one of the big goals that we had in, in Verity, was being able to prove actual implementations that are runnable correct. Um, and so what I've seen in IV so far, the specification of the system is just sort of a uh, relational spec. So I, I guess I'm wondering, like, is there a, can you give me like a quick high level intuition for how that compilation works? Or so, so actually, Ken has done it. So can can do you want to? Okay. So at the moment, uh, basically, you have to refine, right? So you have this high level model, and it's and it's based on some services that are specified in terms of some abstract relations, and you have to implement those services and prove that they satisfy that specification. So you can do that in a modular way. And so the way I'm trying to go about that is to say, maybe at the high level, you're going to use EPR to do the proof. And then as you do refinement, you know, let's say that I want to send a packet, and that packet is really a string. You know, and I need a theory of strings to say that I've put that packet together correctly. Then I want to use the theory of strings in a quantifier-free way to do that refinement. Right. So I still have reliability in the software. So the current story is it's refinement, where you have to refine manually down to an implementation, and then we can generate code when it's in terms of data structures you can actually use. This is that decision makes a lot of sense, right? It means you can worry about finding what's inductive without worrying about details about does this fit in a packet or anything like this. Hopefully, yeah. That's, that's I mean, another possibility, which I was thinking, maybe for example, I don't know what you guys are thinking, but I, I was thinking of maybe combine it with other work that we did with, the, with the Alex Aiken and Stanford, that actually we can take these relations and map it to low-level data structures. And the fact that we have this inductive environment now, maybe we can actually map it to shared memory con concurrency. So, so, th so we can, in fact, use this inductive environment to, to make the, the compilation more, to make the, the, the running time of the, of the result more efficient. So, but that's something that has to be worked out. But I'm thinking that, in fact, from this language, you can compile into low-level code. And you can, I mean, that's not what you guys are doing, I think, right? That's, no, yeah. you, are, you are worrying about the distributed protocol. Oh, no, I, just, I guess I was wondering how do you get the level of implementation. But it seems like the refinement thing makes sense, and there are probably other questions yeah. as well. Yeah, but the refinement makes perfect sense. And nice thing about the refinement of tool of, of, of Ken, that even though he's working on different decidable logics, and, and, and he doesn't need to somehow reason about all of them together. Mm -hmm. That's the beauty of it. Yeah. And it's also the way he did that with modularity in the same way. The other thing I was wondering, if I, could, I don't want to uh, monopolize, but um, it seems like in Ivy, at least from my understanding, there's actually not a lot about the framework that's particular to distributed systems. It seems like you can use this for discovering inductive invariance for all kinds of systems. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Then we don't. Actually, I don't know if it's a good or bad thing. I think it's great, <laughs> right? I mean, that would be even more exciting. No, no, but yeah. So we could do, right. So in fact, we take these relations and we, we can do arbit arbitrary. And you see one example that Ken did is the, is the cyclic garbage collection. It has nothing to do with the distributed system. And we, did, we started. Hardware, too. Yeah, and hardware, and hardware verification. So we can, yeah, it's basically, and as I said, in the software defined network, we actually use essentially the same modeling language. And so, yeah, so, but I think actually, I, I think about it maybe that in the future, Maybe we know something about the distributed system and we can make the verification easier. I don't know how, but somehow, maybe. Like, I mean, you're already doing, like, rely guarantee. You're doing some kind of things in, in which I didn't describe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just right. Set up the composition. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Yes. I'm wondering, like, in Ivy, how you measure, like, the number of refinement steps, because I can imagine com I can combine multiple steps into one single one. If I'm smart enough, to realize that, okay, I both of them. Yeah, yeah, these are just, these are, I mean, you, you I mean, uh, I didn't show you the exact interface, but basically, you, you because uh, you, you point an old, and you can gather effect, and you can take its negation, and whatever. 
You, uh, the number of steps is just an indication. It doesn't really mean anything practical in the sense that you saw that in one protocol we have seven refinement steps and another we have three. It doesn't mean that this is more complicated than others. I think the only measure which is probably important is sort of the size of the of the final environment that may but even there it's you know like in the in the in the case of the between relation it looks very nice but you can sim simulate it equally nice with n star with transitive closure and then the, the environment will be slightly less less nice so yeah these numbers they mean nothing they are just uh, i mean i don't want to say but they are for the table of the pldi they are um, <laughs> they are uh, they, are, they mean nothing in uh, in uh, in uh, realistic sense, especially because these are small examples and they mean nothing. But there are some indication of how hard it is and, and we didn't measure the exact time, but we think that working with such a tool is much easier, especially for people who are, who are domain experts but not experts in the tool. And, and that's what we like about it. The fact that you have five refinement or four refinement, it's, you're absolutely right. Let's uh, thank Millie again.